Okay, so we're going to move on to the second session of Brief Reminiscences. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have uh, someone who's known David for a very long time. Uh, the first reminiscence will be from uh, uh, his elder brother, Robert Mackay. Hi. So uh, I have uh, four stories I'd like to share with you. Uh, my first collaboration with David, I think, was when he was about three years old. <laughs> so it was on prediction. <clears throat> on the uh, way to uh, taking him to the nursery, uh, we'd be on one bus, and our sisters would be on another bus that was taking them to school. And at a certain point in the journey, we would predict how many vehicles there would be between our two buses by the time we reached a certain other point in the journey. So <clears throat> I think we played this virtually every day. <laughs> and it was quite fun. <laughs> Our next uh, story is um, in the early 90s. Uh, David uh, was very enthusiastic, as he still is, about um, Bayesian inference. And he converted me to this. So I, I had a project at the time on time series analysis. Actually, topology from a time series, that's a very fashionable topic these days. Uh, but I <coughs> realized that actually the uh, basic problem in time series analysis would be better addressed by Bayesian inference than people were doing at the time. So <coughs> I never actually developed that. I did write a paragraph at the end of a grant <coughs> proposal final report. In those days, we, we wrote serious final reports on grants instead of this uh, research fish stuff today. But, uh, <laughs> but I didn't get around to pursuing this, which is a shame. But um, then the third thing was uh, the origin of a paper that we wrote together. Uh, I was asking David what he was teaching in the Cavendish, and he said statistical mechanics, and showed me a really nice demo of uh, movable partition in the cylinder with gas at different temperatures and pressures on the two sides. And I said, ah, can you modify this demo to demonstrate how I think uh, <coughs> uh, biomotors like uh, myosin work, which is a sort of um, Szilard engine. So uh, David said, sure, and sent me the demos. And uh, of course, it didn't stop there. We, he uh, injected lots of ideas. So. Uh, we're still waiting for the Nobel Prize to come our way, but, uh, and uh, we would like more physiologists to pick up on this. And uh, David had hoped um, Helmut uh, Grubmüller would be able to be here to talk exactly on that topic, but he wasn't able. So the uh, last story is I uh, got a contract recently from National Grid to work on the understanding and control of inter-area oscillations. These are oscillations in power flow, for example, between Scotland and England when <coughs> there's too much wind in Scotland. And uh, so this sounded uh, great to me. But they said at National Grid they wanted me to start by working on detection from their data. And I thought, oops, I'm not really a data person. So, <coughs> but uh, I said, well, we'll give it a try. So the first thing I did was to ask David, uh, how would you approach this? And he said, use Gaussian processes. And uh, so I had a look, uh, for example, at chapter 34 of his book, <laughs> and thought, yes, this looks a good idea. So that's what we're doing now. So thank you, David. Um, we don't have results to show you yet, but um, be certainly pleased in your criticism and comments on it. So uh, that brings me to the end. Actually, it's a suitable point to pass to. Rasmussen and Williams, who I believe are next. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Robert. I don't think they're going to do it as a double act. I think Chris uh, Williams, uh, who's a professor of machine learning at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, if you uh, watch the beginning of uh, David's Gaussian process introduction that I referred to in my talk, you'll see he refers to Chris and Carl's book is the Bible in there, so. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, great. So, oh, actually, it's slightly cut off the top of the screen. Uh, ah, oh, God. Sorry. You don't expect a computer scientist to be able to drive his computer, do you? Okay. Right, so I first met uh, David in, I think, around 1990 when he visited Jeff Hinton's lab. And uh, one um, Sunday, I think it was, we went out for a drive in the southern Ontario countryside. And uh, at some point, we went past uh, some trees that looked like this. David got very excited and said, can we stop the car? You know, when we went out to figure out what was going on in these. And uh, so actually, for those of you who don't know, these are maple trees. And actually, this is collecting the, the sap from, from maple trees, and, and then, you know, which is then turned into maple syrup, that great uh, Canadian product. So I think, you know, this is, to me, it's one of those reminiscences of David, you know, wanting to know what was going on, you know, very enthusiastic about finding out about that. Other things that uh, happened sort of subsequent to that were, as, um, as was alluded to, um, so both David and uh, Radford Neal in Toronto were working a lot on uh, Bayesian methods for neural networks in the early 90s, and that sort of spawned uh, the work that, uh, that I started, and then with Carl particularly, uh, looking at uh, Gaussian processes. And uh, as people actually, people have referred to David's book there actually about, and he, somewhere about Gaussian processes, uh, as, as Charles mentioned, are these just smoothing devices? And in fact, uh, very nice, nice, nicely phrased in the book, he said, did we throw out the baby with the bathwater when we had Gaussian processes? Is it, are they just smoothing devices? And actually, uh, looking back at, the, uh, at that chapter, I realized that actually, you know, that, that some of the things he actually said there sort of pointed out the fact that what we're now seeing in deep learning, the fact that, um, you know, that in order to actually really do feature extraction and not just smoothing, you might need these deep layers. Although you actually thought, I think, that we actually might need something other than supervised learning. And so far in deep learning, uh, the stuff that works uh, hasn't required that. One other thing I wanted to mention, uh, it's a shame my slides are being, how can I get this full screen? Um, Great. Okay, so one sort of slight side topic which was, uh, David was involved with is that um, along with Miguel Carrera Pepinian, I've been interested in the question of whether a mixture of isotropic Gaussians can have more modes than components. And uh, it turns out the answer to that is yes, and a very nice construction due to Hans Deistermatt uh, from Utrecht was that if we have an equilateral triangle arrangement of isotropic Gaussians, then for a very particular, um, well, particular range of variances of these Gaussians, actually this point in the center here, I haven't got a point of it anyway, the, the point there right in the middle, actually turns out to be another little mode. So you can actually get more um, modes than actually components, which is quite, quite interesting. And one thing that uh, David did is, given this construction, he then, um, generalize this and thought about, well, what happens if I uh, arrange these Gaussians in a sort of benzene ring structure and actually then through this Kekulé construction, and this stuff is still on the web, um, then actually you can create, um, so the, the simple construction I just talked on the previous slide has four thirds the number of maxima compared to the number of centers and this, this rather nice and also rather beautiful GNU plot graphics uh, output here actually uh, gives this number of five-thirds of the number of maxima. So those are some sort of reminiscences about, about David. And I think I was just lo recently looking at uh, online and, and reading some stuff about medicine. And I came across this slogan. And I think this, for me, um, typifies so much. You know, as, as, as Neil said, you, you know, sometimes you've got a rather, you've got the spotlight of David's critical thinking on your problem, and that might be uncomfortable sometimes, but it was definitely very helpful. And I think some of the things that we, you know, that I've learned from David are, you know, this notion of demanding evidence and thinking critically, as well as also those kind of creative aspects that, you know, for example, that KQLA construction show. Thank you. So I, th I think definitely that, and also it's great that you showed a slide from his website, because there was a time when actually 
uh, most, how about half the interesting content on the internet was on David's website. <laughs> <laughs> that, that predates Wikipedia, but uh, it did remind me of that. Uh, so continuing uh, the Toronto connection, I guess, with the first meeting, Carl Rasmussen, who's professor in engineering here in Cambridge. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, so a lot of us here, here today have uh, talked about how uh, the two properties of the David has sort of very straight thinking and very and, and extremely good communication uh, have have been have been uh, so important. And I'll, I would just like to um, give a personal example of the of the second one of uh, of David's talks. So the very first time I met David was uh, in 1991. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Edinburgh. I was a visiting student in Edinburgh, and David came up and gave a talk. Um, at the time, I worked on uh, mathematical models of phys physiological development. Uh, I didn't know anything about probability theory at all. Uh, so I'm not actually really sure why I went to David's talk. Uh, so that, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I went down to the talk, and, um, and David at the time must have been had just started his PhD, or maybe not even started his PhD at the time, and he talked about Bayesian neural networks and the evidence framework, and I was totally fascinated by the talk. I think that was just fantastic, and I spent the next two months literally bugging everybody to try to explain to me, you know, things like, you know, what is Bayesian about Bayesian statistics, and how can somebody be a non-Bayesian, uh, <laughs> and, uh, 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 and questions like that that, that have... That have uh, that I've, that I've spent uh, cycles on since then, right? So, uh, so I think that's, uh, um, it's really fantastic to be around David, and I think uh, some of us aspire to, uh, to have his uh, clarity of thought, but maybe most of us think that you know, that's not really possible. So what I sort of try to inspire to is to, to, give, to give good presentations, because I think you know, he's really, uh, I, I don't think I, I get very far, but at least I'm, look, I'm looking in the right direction, I know. So, so thank you a lot for that, David. Great, and uh, so it's over to uh, one of David's ex-students, and it's a, a, one remarkable thing about David is even when he's not there, you hang out with his ex-students. We had a whole circle of us at NIPS this year, talking to him, the first of those we can hear from is Hannah Wallach, who's a researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Hannah. So I started my PhD with David in 2002. I was in my early 20s at the time, and David was in his mid-30s. Um, I'm sure it's not going to be a huge surprise to anybody in this room that David and I didn't always get on super well during my PhD. Uh, I think he found me to be infinitely frustrating. <laughs> I remember him explaining to me why we don't just dump a bunch of LaTeX equations into a slide template when we're going to give a talk. <laughs> why sanity checking our results is, you know, kind of a good idea. Uh, why Gaussian processes might be a pretty good model. Why representing uncertainty is great. Why perplexity isn't the best way to evaluate our language models. Why, if I wanted to work on various trendy non-Bayesian things, he might not be the right person for me to do that with. And why he wasn't entirely sure it was a great idea for me to spend 80% of my PhD in a different country to him. <laughs> and at the time, I thought he was being completely unreasonable. And I pushed back <laughs> very, very hard. I gave some truly terrible talks. I tried to work on all kinds of extremely trendy non-Bayesian things. And I did, in fact, spend a lot of my PhD in the United States. But here's the thing, I'm in my mid-30s now. I have my own PhD students, and I've come to realize that maybe David wasn't so unreasonable. <laughs> I regularly find myself saying things that I realize, usually once they're halfway out of my mouth, that I, in fact, first heard these things from David. Uh, I've told my PhD students that they can't work on various trendy non-Bayesian things if they want to work with me. I've told them they can't just dump LaTeX into slide templates. I've told them I'd really prefer that they don't use perplexity when they're evaluating their language models. And in fact, I've even told PH PhD students that they can't go live in another country if they're going to work with me. <sighs> 
I've also come to realize that somehow, despite the fact that I did spend all that time in the US, I've learned more from David than anyone else I've ever worked with. He's had a greater impact on my thinking than anyone else I've ever met. He's taught me how to be a principled researcher, how to give coherent talks, how to convey intuition rather than just throwing math at people, how to think critically and clearly when approaching a new problem. So last night, David told us at dinner that he has an internal Radford simulator, and I laughed because I have an internal David simulator. I'm pretty sure it's not very good, and I'm certain it really drives my students and collaborators crazy, but I can't imagine doing research without it. So thank you, David. I know I wasn't the easiest student, but I'm infinitely grateful for you, to you for sticking it out and for shaping my thinking and my research. I really love what I do today, and I definitely wouldn't be here without your inspiration and your guidance and your patience. So thank you. So uh, it's coffee and tea break now, and we'll be back in here at four o'clock.